let's get to work. Anyone ready to get to work? Let's get to work. If you have a Bible, and I hope you have a Bible because on Sundays like this, you will need a Bible. Would you turn to Ephesians chapter two, beginning in verse 19, and then turn to, wow, okay, okay, we're going. And then and go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and then Romans chapter 12, verse nine through 10. And the reason you have to have your Bible with you, in fact, if you don't have a Bible and you want a Bible, just keep your hands up for a few minutes and then some ushers will grab some Bibles. They don't know I just said this, but they will do it and they'll grab it and they'll bring it to you so you have a Bible so you can follow along because all of these will not be on the screen. And I wanna show you how these three particular verses are speaking to each other in our series this morning. We're starting a six week series called Citizens and Saints. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna pull a bait and switch on you. I'm gonna tell you upfront what this series is. For the next six weeks, I'm gonna teach you, we're gonna teach you the theology and the practice of what it means to be a part of the church. Or what does it mean, what is, it, what, what is the church? What is the theology of it? And, and if you are to be a part of that church, what should you practice to be a part of that particular church? And I would argue that these five practices would be true of any Christian in any church that they belong to. These aren't things that we made up, these are in the scriptures. And I also want to ask you, again, no bait and switch. I'm gonna ask you to actually, at the end of the series, to prayerfully consider making a commitment to this house for the next calendar year. So this isn't, you know, you're, you're part of this church for the next 50 years and, and you can't move anywhere, or you can't do anything. You, you know, you have to ask my permission to drink water. That's, that's none of that. So there'll be, so everything you need for to know, hey, what does it mean to commit to this church? What does this church believe theologically? What's our doctrine? What are our practices? What do we believe about different things? All of that starting tomorrow is gonna be available on our app. So go on the app so you can see everything we believe and what the actual commitment is. But listen, the moment I say commitment to a church, some of us, we sort of, Feels gross, doesn't it? Because some of us, let's be honest, we're very, we're very independent. I, I don't need a group to belong to. In fact, the only thing I'm committed is being committed to nothing. I'm, a, I'm an independent person. I liked my autonomy. I like to do things on my own. And then for many other people, the, the word church just feels like you're on a losing team, es especially in 2021. Because to say you're a pastor in 2021 is almost the equivalent of bragging that you're the captain of the Titanic. <laughs> you are on a losing team. The boat is sinking. It is a hopeless endeavor. And listen, I get it. I grew up in the church. I grew up in the church in India and I grew up in the church in America. So I have two different contexts of churches. I grew up in the church. I was born in the church. I was raised in the church, you know it's coming. I was probably conceived in the church, okay? So I, I get it. I get when people ask that question, what good could possibly come out of the church? One of my favorite stories is in John chapter two. Jesus begins his public ministry and Philip begins to follow Jesus. Philip, upon realizing who Jesus is, goes and he tells his friend Nathaniel, we have found the one, we have found the Messiah, he's come out of Nazareth. And his friend Nathaniel says, what good could come out of Nazareth? So I get it. When we say, hey, come to church, be a part of a church. Well, what good could come out of Nazareth? What good could come out of the church? And yet, if you read the scriptures, Jesus is not right now in heaven directing the angelic choirs. Jesus is not getting a board together to figure out how to start more nonprofits to meet the needs of humanity. Jesus is not planning the next great epic worship tours. The only thing Jesus is doing between now and eternity, according to Jesus, is building his church and calling you and I to be a part of it. When I think about the church and, and where it is today, in 2021, churches that are riddled with scandals, I mean, just, it's almost as if it's just commonplace now. Fallen pastor, fallen pastor, fallen church, scandal after scandal, trauma, abuse. I was watching a documentary a few weeks ago about World War II. It's one thing to know that the Catholic church, the church capitulated to the Nazis. It's a whole other thing to realize that they helped actual war criminals escape. Joseph Mengele, the angel of death who ran Auschwitz, one of the most evil men in the history of the world. 
had the church's help to change his identity and move to Argentina. And so you're thinking to yourself, why could you be a part of something that has all of this baggage with it, that has all of this destruction and evil that's a part of it? Why would you want to be a part of this? And when I think about the church, I think about the words of T.S. Eliot, the great poet. In 1934, he wrote a poem titled The Rock. And it was actually a poem written as a fundraiser to help 45 different church buildings rebuild. But for T.S. Eliot, he knew that it wasn't about the building. It was about the community that was being built. It was about having a place where the knowledge of God was known and taught. It was a place, as he called it, a sanctuary for those who felt alienated by the world. And he says this line in this poem, he says, the church must be forever building for it is forever decaying within and attacked from without. So let's just set this from the onset. Why would the church be necessary? Let's first get to what the aim of the Christian life is. If the aim of the Christian life is to behave better, if the aim of the Christian life is to just look the Christian part, then you absolutely do not need the church in your life. You have enough supplemental resources, you don't need the church at all. But the aim of the Christian life is to become like Jesus. The aim of your Christian life is to become like Jesus. We live in a culture today that's obsessed with doing. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing when you graduate? What are you doing when you get married? What are you doing when you get your first job? What, what neighborhood are you gonna move to? We're in a culture obsessed with doing and the scriptures are more obsessed with who we're becoming. My, my middle son, Eli, all my kids are in swim lessons <clears throat> because they're brown and they think they know how to swim, but they don't know how to swim. <laughs> like, we know how to swim. Listen, if you have to have floaties on, it doesn't count <laughs> as swimming. You have to learn how to swim. And my middle son, Eli, is in a season where it's just really intimidating for him to get in the water. And so he's really, and so I'm trying every tactic to get in the water. I'm trying fear. I'm trying, do you want to die? Do you want to, what if you fall in the water? He's like, we don't even have a pool, but what if we did? And you fell in, you? so I'm trying fear. Fear's not working. I'm trying vision, man, this summer, all your friends are gonna be in the pool. You're gonna swim along with them. You're gonna be like a little Michael Phelps and he, he, nothing's working. And I'm starting to get agitated with him and I'm starting to now get angry at him for not getting in the water. And, and I'm catching myself, ever had those, any parents in the house where you're, you're catching yourself saying something to your kids and you're thinking to yourself, what the heck is wrong with you? Like who has become the crazy person in this relationship and you just can't stop yourself? And it, it's like an outer body experience of your body telling your own body, stop, stop talking, stop talking. And I'm ask, as I'm driving with my son who is now crying in the back seat, I'm asking myself, man, who am I becoming? What kind of father am I becoming? Who cares if my children know how to swim if they have a father who acts like this? Friends, we have to ask the question, who are we becoming? And we become what we practice. So if you want to become like Jesus, then that requires an ownership of responsibility of practice. Now, how do we become like Jesus? I would argue that there's three partners in your transformation. But whenever someone says, is it true that the gospel wants to change you? Yes, Jesus wants to change you. And in order for that transformation to happen, it requires three partners. Partner number one, who will never fail you, is God. God will always bring himself to the equation. God is the giver of all truth. He's the giver of all grace. He's the giver of all power for you to become who God has called you to be. But God doesn't operate in a vacuum and neither do you. So God has created this body of believers globally, historically, and locally known as the church. And here, as you practice the way of Jesus in the church, the church's job is to gather the people of God. The church's job is to, Ephesians 4.11, equip the people for the work of the ministry. And the church's job is to care for, holistically care for the people of God to whom the church is covenanted. But the third person in that equation is you. You actually have to take ownership of your own faith. See, for too long, when I was growing up, it was primarily the church's responsibility to raise our kids. So go to Awana, go to VBS, get your flanograms, wear your Lord's Gym t-shirt, you get to church and the church will raise you. 
And the question you gotta ask is, well, how's that going? How's that going? Because the church has become ineffective in doing that. Listen, parents, whether your kids are in high school or your kids are in elementary school, you don't partner with the church to raise your kids. The church partners with you to raise your kids. We got your kids for an hour a week. You got them for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We partner with you. But then there's a whole other generation now that's come up, sort of this kind of millennial gen, gen, and sort of Gen Z where we don't need the church. We just need me and God and the mountains and cheap beer and we can do church. Listen, you at happy hour eating tacos, it's not church. That's just, you're broke and you can't afford actual price tacos, so you go to happy hour. It's not church. You, you affording, you, you drinking apricot blonde with your friends in the mountains just means you have bad taste in beer and you have poor theology in the church. It's not church. It's not. Church is to gather with the people of God where there is authority and accountability and there is baptism and there is communion and there is leadership and there's the scriptures and there's the presence of God and the spirit of God working together to cultivate us to become more like who? Jesus. Come on, more like who? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. And so, so we wanna sort of unpack. What, is, what does it look like? And so our first practice, we have five practices. I'm gonna go right into our first practice and we're calling it the practice of presence. And the title of my message today is Agents of Presence. We are agents of presence. Friends, what is tragic today, and let me begin with what I think is the most tragic thing, is the number of people who have been hurt by the church. I mean, so much so that it's a hashtag. And the abuse and the hurt and the trauma, the spiritual manipulation, the physical manipulation, the, the physical abuse, the spiritual abuse, the mental abuse, it is tragic that the beautiful community that God is building is known more today for the way they hurt people than heal people. What's equally as tragic are the number of confessing Christians. Christians, you know, Joey, I don't know what, I don't know what it means when people do this. Christians. We have the number of Christian writers, Christian authors, Christian influencers, who use you as a market to sell their product, but have no interest in all in their presence to be a part of the community. So they'll sell you their books, sell you their blogs, sell you their CDs, not CDs, singles. They'll sell you all that stuff, all their products, but want nothing to actually do with their community. What's tragic today, I was, I was driving with, with Alex. Alex is my good looking younger brother who's our young adult pastor here. And every time I'm with Alex, I'm like, man, I'm ugly. But that's a different story for a different day. <laughs> and I was, telling, I was telling Alex, you know, like, I have all these things that pastors say that I, I sometimes catch on social media. And I have, a, I have a growing list of things pastors say that really just frustrate me and irritate me. One of the ones is this. When, ever, ever, heard, ever heard a pastor say, I don't know who this is for? Ever hear that one before? I don't know who this is for. What that tells me is that pastor and those ministry leaders know their congregation theoretically, but they don't know them intimately. When I wanna preach, I wanna preach to you because I know that you're going through six years of cancer. I wanna preach to you because today marks the day that two years ago, you lost your husband. I wanna preach to you, the one whose second child is wandering from the Lord and you're wondering if all the mistakes you made when you were first parenting have now caught up to you. I wanna, I wanna preach to you the, the stay-at-home mom that is more filled with guilt than vision. That's who I wanna preach to. I wanna know you intimately, not just preach to you theoretically. And it's tragic now that people are part of churches where they're known in theory, but they're not known in actual presence. So if they were gone, they wouldn't be missed because you're just sort of an empty seat. But you wouldn't actually be missed because you don't actually believe your presence is a gift and no one's ever told you that you actually belong. It's tragic, it's tragic. And I'm hoping today that we begin to set the course of the future and that the church of the future actually calls people to the highest biblical standard, not the lowest cultural value. So go with me. That was just the intro, so go with me. <laughs> go with me to Ephesians chapter two, verse 19 through 20. 
Verse 19, Paul writes this to the church in Ephesus and the church to us today. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. So then you are no longer strangers. What the Bible is setting, what Paul is saying is that apart from Christ, you and I are actually strangers with one another looking out for number one. We are at hostility towards one another and hostility with God. But now in Christ Jesus, we are now brought together, no longer aliens or strangers, but now into the family of God together. We are now part of, as Dr. Tony Evans would say, a covenant community of God and his people. And it all hinges on that word, but. I told you a lot of buts in the Bible. You were strangers, you were aliens, but, but now you are no longer. When he says no longer, Paul is not giving you a suggestion. I suggest to you that you're no longer something. He's actually giving you what is known in the scriptures as an indicative, a fact, a truth. The Bible is split into two categories, the indicative and the imperative. The indicative is that which is true, whether you like it, whether you feel like liking it, whether you want to believe it, it's true. For God so loved the world, that is true. And based on the indicative is the imperative, what you and I should now do, how should we live, what what must we obey? So it is true. He's not saying that you might have a feeling that you belong. He's saying what is true is three things. Based on the fact that you are no longer a stranger, no longer an alien, there are three true things about you and I. Truth number one, we are fellow citizens. Paul says in Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, that we are, that our citizenship is in heaven. Let me be very, very clear to you. The gospel is not a ticket to heaven. The gospel is not good advice on how to live like good pagan people. The gospel is not the good fortune that God simply wants to take you from this bad place called earth and transport you one day to a lovely place called heaven. The gospel according to Jesus of Nazareth is that in and through him, the long awaited kingdom of God has arrived. Heaven has invaded the earth. And the central message of Jesus in every gospel, the central message of Jesus was the entrance of the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God, or as Tony Evans would say, the comprehensive rule of God, as Dallas Willard would say, the range of God's effective will. The kingdom of God is where what God wants done gets done. That is the central message of Jesus, that you and I need to live in an unshakable new kingdom. And the entrance into that kingdom is not behaving well. It's not spiritual inheritance. It doesn't matter what your parents believe. It doesn't matter what other people believe. It doesn't even matter what your church believes. The entrance into that kingdom is your personal confession and repentance that Jesus is Lord. That is the entrance into that kingdom to be, to confess his Lordship, to repent, to turn from your ways into the way of Jesus and to be baptized into a local church, globally, historically, and locally, to be filled with the power of the Spirit, and as the scriptures say, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Now, the result of coming into that kingdom is that you are now a citizen, which means, listen to me, which means you live here now, though as one whose full allegiance is to the kingdom of God. Yes, we celebrate your ethnicity, Yes, we celebrate our nationality. We should. Your nationality and your ethnicity is not something that is wicked and evil. I am ethnically Indian, and I'm working on right now my citizenship to become an American. Y'all don't know how hard it is. Found paperwork. I mean, how hard, how hard is it to be an American citizen? I got a wife for 15 years and four kids. Like, what else do I got to do? You know? And you guys don't know what it's like to be married to a citizen. I gotta be real careful with what I say to Hannah. Say, you might, your wife might kick you out the house. She might kick me out the country. Okay, so I gotta be, I gotta be real careful. Cause she gives me that look and I know what that look means. Deported. I get it. I see it. I see it. She's like, what'd you say to me? Do, do, do. INS. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> 
So we celebrate our ethnicity, we celebrate our nationality, but make no mistake, your highest allegiance is not to a flag or to a people. Your highest allegiance is to the cross of Jesus and his kingdom. We live as a people with heavenly rights, with heavenly inheritance that cannot be shaken. Every kingdom of this world can be shaken economically, physically, socially, politically. Even the kingdom of your own life can switch on a phone call. One of my friends years ago that I led to the Lord, he called me on Thursday. His life switched in an instant. He had a significant pain in his knee. He thought he tore his ACL. Turns out it's bone cancer. He has three young kids under the age of seven. And next week, they might have to amputate his leg, which is maybe best case scenario. They have to treat him with radiation. And all that, he doesn't even know if he'll live to the end of the year. But listening to the hope that he has in the Lord, yesterday as I called him, our kingdoms can be shaken that fast. But the Bible says in Hebrews, but ours is a kingdom that is unshakable. And as citizens, we are agents of, and ambassadors of the kingdom of God to our relationships, our cities, our neighborhoods, our places of work. And the church, listen, is a microcosm of the kingdom of God on earth. The church is not a club. The church is not an exclusive thing that people are not allowed to be a part of. The church is not even a good hobby. The church is an embassy. Whenever I take my wife to India, the first place I take her is the United States embassy. I take her, I'm like, here is the embassy, and it's gated, and there's Marines guarding the door. And I tell her, if this country is falling apart, if anything happens, don't go to the nicest hotel, don't go to the hospital, don't even go to the church. Go to the U.S. Embassy, and you run towards them, and you show them your passport. They won't let me in, but they'll definitely let you in. (laughs) Because even though that embassy is in India, once you're in there, it's American soil. That's what the church is. Though we are on earth, this is kingdom soil. Your home is kingdom soil. Your cubicle at work, kingdom soil. Our vision is that we would own this entire property. So when people drive by, that's kingdom soil. The kingdom of God is there. And these are embassies of the kingdom of God. And as every embassy in the world has ambassadors, we are ambassadors of that kingdom. We don't represent our kingdoms. The good ambassadors, the best ambassadors don't represent their interests. They represent the interests of their nations, of their kingdoms. In the same way, we represent the best things of the kingdom of God, not our own preferences. We are citizens of a new kingdom. Secondly, second truth about this. We are citizens with the saints. If you read almost every New Testament epistle, they begin with Paul, Peter, so-and-so to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Rome, to the saints in Corinth. Now, who is a saint? Now, culturally, sort of Christianese, a saint is just sort of a good person. Like, oh, she, the sweet young boy helped me get my groceries in my car. What a saint. (laughs) Right? It's just like you're a good person. You held the door open for someone. You're a saint. You paid your bills on time. You're a saint. You, you don't swear, except when no one's listening. You're a saint. <laughs> so we have this sort of cultural saint kind of, ah, oh, kind of like a good person. Now, culturally, in Christian culture, there are people who are known as saints. Now, this is primarily from the Catholic tradition. Now, to be a saint in the Catholic tradition has 10 steps and can cost up to millions of dollars. You want to know the 10 steps? Say, I want to know. All right, first, you gotta be Catholic. That's number one. Number two, you gotta be dead. Three, your, your life has to be investigated because, fourthly, there is a local following that has arisen because of your life. Fifth, a local bishop has to send your case to the Vatican. Sixth, you have had to have prayed for a miracle in your life and that miracle has to have happened. Well, seven, that miracle has to be investigated. Eighth, The Vatican declared, eighth, you have to pray for another miracle. And then after that miracle, then the Vatican professes you as a saint. 10 steps, millions of dollars, lots of prayers for you to be a saint. And you gotta be dead, by the way. But according to Paul, to be a saint, the word there means to be set apart, to be holy. 
To be a saint means that you have now been transitioned or transformed from one who is a sinner into one who is holy by the blood of Jesus. Not no work of your own. The only miracle that's happened is that the miracle of your death has now turned into the resurrection of life. By no work of your own. By the work of Jesus and Jesus alone. So to Paul, to be a saint takes one step, to be in Christ. To be in Christ, you are a saint. Saints are those whose entire happiness is found and sustained in the person of Jesus Christ. It is a person, the people who live in the holy fear of God and tremble at his presence, but not as those who are afraid of his judgment, but rather those who are delighted to be overwhelmed by the beauty and the transforming presence of a perfect being who in an instant could wipe us from the face of the earth, yet instead chooses to include us in love and joy that has existed from eternity past and will continue into a never ending future. And we, those of us in Christ, we are not just saints who wander aimlessly, Rather, we who were once alienated from the life of God and lived as orphans have now, through the blood of Jesus, been invited to participate in the household of God, historically, globally, and gathered locally. And then truth number three, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members. Members simply means those who belong. Dr. E. Stanley Jones said, if you belong to Christ and I belong to Christ, then we belong to each other. Which means, friends, listen to this very carefully. I posted this on Facebook a few weeks ago and it blew up real quick. And my mom was like, please stop commenting. <laughs> it, was just, it, was going, it was going fast. Which means to be a Christian is to belong to the church historically, globally, and locally. As a member, you have gifts meant for the blessing of the body of Christ. Yeah. You are blessed by those gifts of others. You are needed in the body of Christ and you belong, and listen to me, your presence matters. One of my favorite couples in the world are Bob and Judy Culp, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And they would sit in the front row, now they were probably late 60s. And Bob is, I'm talking man's man. I mean, Indiana already makes these excruciatingly strong farm boys to begin with. Whenever I need something moved, you know, Jason's from Indiana. I'm like, Jason, come move my car. You know, just... And Bob is a man's man. I'm talking muscle. His hands are like sandpaper. He could outwork a group of 20-year-olds like that. And Bob and Judy would sit in the front row, her body riddled with cancer. Their marriage just years ago, which was once divorced, now the Lord reunited. And they would stand hand in hand and they would worship together in faithfulness. And I'm the worship leader. And yet Bob and Judy Culp who know nothing about music, who've never taken a music class, probably know less doctrine than I know, are in the front row encouraging me, the worship leader. The moments that I don't wanna believe in God's faithfulness, the moments I don't wanna sing about God's faithfulness and God's goodness to people, their presence matters. Friends, your presence matters. It matters in the body of Christ. So when we say the word membership, I know there's some feelings that get conjured up. For many people, the idea of church membership, you're just uninformed. Not in a derogatory sense, you just don't know what the scriptures say, and that's, good. that's okay, that's good. We're here to learn together. Some of us, though, are just fiercely, fiercely independent. Some of us are just indecisive, just indecisive. Like, my Lord, make a decision. One, day, like one way or another, just make a decision. And then some of us are deeply wounded deeply wounded, myself included, deeply wounded. And to all of these things, my prayer for this series is that you would grow in the knowledge of God, you would grow deeper in the fellowship of believers, and that the Lord would heal you. Like in these next week, six weeks, God would fully heal you of the hurt that you have experienced. I love the words of, of Jackie Perry Hill. She says, the only place to be healed from church hurt is with the church. Now, let's continue in our time remaining. As fellow citizens with the saints and the members, what's happening to us? Do we sort of just gather for the sake of gathering? It's like, oh, this is a fun club. That I got to go from nine, my club meets at nine to 11 and that one meets from 11 to, you know, whatever. Like, is it just a fun thing we get to do? What, what's actually happening? Well, the scriptures tell us in Ephesians that we are joined together and we're being built. One of the most 
incredible places I've ever gone to before, and I've been there multiple times, is the Taj Mahal. There's nothing like it in America. I'm sorry, there's nothing like the Taj Mahal. I love going to the Taj Mahal. And every time I go, when you go to the Taj Mahal, you, you can't wear your shoes. You have to take your shoes off and you have to check them in. The first time I went, someone stole my AJ1s. To this day, if I see a kid in AJ1s like, yo, slum dog, give me my shoes back. <laughs> there's nothing like the Taj Mahal. But when you look at the Taj Mahal and this incredible, incredible structure, you ask yourself two questions. Who built this and for what purpose? The Taj Mahal was built by Shah Jahan, who built it as a memorial ground to lay the body of his favorite wife, not just his only wife, his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. So to, to, the, to the same degree, when we talk about the church gathering, we got to ask the question, who's building it and for what purpose? Otherwise, none of this actually matters. What matters is who's building it and why it's being built or for what reason it's being built. Now go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. We see for the first time the word church spoken in the scriptures, and the first time it's spoken is by the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus asked Peter, hey, Peter, who do people say that I am? Like, oh, some say you're Elijah, some say you're a prophet, some say, is it, okay, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. He says, yes, Peter, upon this confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Who is building the church? Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh, fully human, fully God, the radiance of the image of God, the one who is supremely preeminent over all things, the one who holds the world in the palm of his hand, the one who decided this morning that you got to have breath in your lungs, the one who told the sun to rise, the one who tells the moon tonight to reflect, the one who names all the stars, that's the one who is building his church. He's building it. And he is the builder. He is the designer. He's the architect. He's the financier. He's the cornerstone. So beware if you're in the business of destroying, dividing, gossiping, or attacking the church, you are doing those things to that which Jesus loves and paid for with his blood and his building. It is Jesus who is taking us, the broken ones, the wandering ones, the lonely ones, the depressed ones, the anxious, the anxious ones. He's taking all of us and he is building carefully, lovingly, gently, moving us together to become what he has called us to be. Now let's just go over some couple quick definitions for you. If you have a phone, you can, you can take a picture of this. If not, it's all on the app for you. Let's define two quick things. What is the church and who is the church? What is the church? The church is the embassy of God's kingdom on earth. It is the authority on earth instituted by Jesus to give shape and affirm the lives of God's people. It is the influence in society to bring the comprehensive rule of heaven into every sphere of life and culture. It is the embodiment of the ministry of Jesus to make disciples of all nations upon his return. Now, who is the church? It is those who gather as disciples of Jesus, the local, global, historical expression of God's people. The fellowship of believers shaped through biblical practices and in this, the intentional effort of disciples to become an inter-ethnic and intergenerational worshiping people. So let's follow the biblical framework here. If Jesus is the builder of the church and the definer of the church, then firstly, our participation in presence in what Jesus is building is not a suggestion, but an imperative. Secondly, our personal preferences, privileges, opinions, desires, decisions, and expectations are not actually what the church is built on or aiming to be. All of our personal preferences, and let's be honest, we got some, don't we? The music is too loud. Pastor's jeans are too tight. (laughs) The chairs are too narrow. The carpet's not my favorite color. The TV's not the right size. I don't like the font. Can you guys meet on Wednesday at four? No. It's not... Well, my preference is, well, then you should start your own church that meets at four, okay? <laughs> Let's be honest. We, we choose by preference, don't we? But all of our preferences must submit to the lordship of Jesus and the call for, the, and call for local unity. Now, now, listen, this does not mean that as members of the church, you are subjecting yourself to abuse or coercion or control. Rather, it means to, to discipline yourself, to think biblically and critically. Listen, there's a big difference between a critical mind and a cynical spirit. So think biblically and critically and evaluate and aim to construct from the inside the kind of church that Jesus envisions. 
Don't be the guy that stands outside and tells firemen how to put the fire out. If you want to help put the fire out, then put on a suit and get inside. Get inside and let's do the work together. And what is it that Jesus envisions that we are, listen, being built together into a dwelling place for God, that we would become the temple of God's presence. Now we know from the scriptures that God does not dwell in a place made by human hands. So the church friends is not a building where people are gathered. The church is the people that are gathered whom God is building for his presence to be known. When people walk into your home and walk into the church and walk into wherever you are, they should sense the presence of God. Okay, so we've established who builds it and for what purpose. But we must also then ask, how? How is the church built? It seems rather evident today that the church is being built on the charisma of one person or on the talent of a few people. It then makes sense that churches, especially here in the West, are falling apart at the seams, riddled with scandals, toxic culture, racism, prejudicial undertones, nationalistic fervor, departure from orthodox doctrine. And if that isn't bad enough, we have churches that have compromised on their theology for the sake of social justice, capitulated with the culture for the sake of social acceptance. We have churches that, that won't budge on truth, but exhibit not one ounce of the compassion of Jesus. Or we have churches that hold fast to compassion while altogether watering down truth for the fear of being perceived as too dogmatic. In other words, we have churches who have become weak and ineffective because they have forgotten that the primary building block of the church is not money, personality, cultural relevance, or social influence. Rather, the church as Jesus has defined it and designed it is to be built on from the earliest day to the present day, and most certainly the church of the future is built on love. Love. Now, to sort of end our time, we're gonna go over our practice. I sort of set the stage for us. There's five membership practices found in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse nine through 10. So go with me here for just a moment. But it all sort of begins in verse 12, in verse nine, I'm sorry. In verse nine, Paul says, he's speaking to the church. Let love be genuine and abhor what is evil. And here's for our first practice. We talk about presence, practicing presence. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. This church is to be built on love. Love, which means to seek the highest good of those with whom you are covenanted to. Paul is making the case that if we are to seek the highest good of one another with the affection of Christ and outdo one another in showing honor, then our presence matters because presence is the essential ingredient of love. In other words, to truly honor one another, you must be willing to honor them, listen, with your presence. So to be an agent of presence, write this down, memorize it, take a photograph of it. To be an agent of presence is two things. Number one, you have to take seriously your calling to become like Jesus. You gotta take that seriously. And secondly, you have to take ownership of the formation of others. This is why Paul says in Colossians, 1, 20 through 29. Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we might, we might help build others towards the maturity of Christ. For this, I labor and toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. The aim of this church is not for you to become like me or to become like Trevor or Jason or Liz or Alex or Jordan or whoever. The aim of this church is for you to become more like Jesus. And we take ownership of that with one another which means that presence must be a habit, a ministry, and it is the mission. Let's talk about habit. We're almost done. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says that we are encouraged and challenged and it directs us to stir one another up to love and good works, to not neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. You miss long enough, it becomes a habit a pattern in your life. You don't just wake up one morning and say, I want nothing to do with the gathering of God's people. It's a habit long enough, distracted long enough, Broncos tickets that look good long enough, sleeping in that looks good long enough, shopping that looks good long enough, and it's a habit that is formed in your life. We must, if we are to be genuine, active, loving followers of Jesus, take seriously the commands of Jesus. In this particular context, the command to be actually present with God's people. 
At some point, we have to stop taking the commands of Jesus as mere suggestions and embrace them as commands, remembering that the primary reason we gather is not to be entertained, to be con to consume, to check off the spiritual box, but because we love God. We are being built into a dwelling place for God, not ourselves. D.L. Moody once said, church attendance is as vital to a disciple as transfusion of rich, healthy blood is to a sick man. Presence is the first practice because without presence, we cannot practice anything else, which means presence is the foundational practice in being formed. So families, singles, friends, value the gathering of God's people, value it. Secondly, presence is a ministry. Presence, listen to this, is to be available without pretense, to listen without preference, to show up for, to be active in the lives of, to care for the needs of others above our own. This is the essence of showing honor. And the command is to outdo one another with this honor. Presence indicates that someone has willingly, you have willingly sacrificed whatever agenda that you would usually default to and instead make a commitment to actually be engaged in the life of others. And for this church, for the people of God, this is fundamentally necessary, not for our own numerical growth, but for the growth of our spiritual depth. Presence means showing up physically. It sends the clear message that, that we are all serious about taking responsibility for our own formation into the likeness of Christ, but also taking responsibility for the physical, mental, relational, and spiritual well-being of others with whom we are called to be present with. It seems today that people, including professing Christians, desire and demand the benefits of community, all the while fiercely guarding their own personal autonomy. For the Christian, this is simply, this simply cannot be. Presence, especially in the church, with the church, gathering with the church in the assembly, gathering in the homes of believers is the remedy to the culture that hides behind screens and digital networks. Physical presence is to embrace a life together with others and working for the good of others. Yeah. Now, finally, presence is a habit, it's a ministry, but it's also the mission. I'll end with one last story. Several years ago, my wife and I were traveling in, in Bangalore. Bangalore, you could argue, is the sort of tech center or the Silicon Valley of India. As we were on the streets, we were shopping. My brother was over there negotiating $1 off a watch that he really wanted. <laughs> my wife and I are walking, and, and if you heard this story, I, I apologize, but it's just, it was one of those moments. Ever had a moment in your life that's just seared into your mind, and, and the Lord took that moment and just changed the the trajectory of your life. It was that moment, one of those moments for me. And as my wife and I are walking, we see a, a girl laying on the streets asleep. She must have been 15 or 16. And what caught our attention was in front of her was a girl must have been two, three years old, only wearing a shirt, playing with an empty water bottle. And my heart just begins to just shatter in a million pieces. And I'm thinking to myself, we have a two-year-old at home who has the best of everything, born in the best hospitals money can buy, has apparently babies today need these, you know, NASA-shaped, NASA-engineered NASA bottles to get milk because apparently the old-fashioned way doesn't work as good and, you know, just the best of everything. And here is a, a two-year-old child with nothing except a teenage mom sleeping on the street. And so I begin talking to her. My cousins are with me. We begin talking to her, and, and clearly she's hungry. So, I, so as we're talking, because my wife doesn't know Tamil, I said, Hannah, can you go get her some food? And so she, she looks around, and, and the best food she could buy, this is a true story, is Kentucky Fried Chicken. So she goes and gets Kentucky Fried Chicken for this little girl. And, and, we're, wait, and we're trying to wake up the mom. We're trying to wake her up. And I mean, she is just dead asleep. And at a certain point, we are now sort of violently shaking her. And I had this thought that she actually was dead. And after a while of shaking her, asking her to wake up, she sort of, sort of, sort of you know, blood starts coming back to her head and she, her eyes open and she sort of sits up. And, and as she sits up, there tucked beneath her was a probably a two week old, naked infant girl. And if my heart wasn't shattered before, it was absolutely obliterated in that moment. This girl's only crime was to have two daughters culture and a husband that doesn't want daughters. Our only crime. 
here's a 15-year-old girl who can't read, who can't write, has no money to her name. Her only crime is to give birth to two daughters. So her husband gave her a choice, either kill or sell the two daughters or take them all and leave. What's a six-year-old mother to do? So she takes this child, gets on a bus, gets off at Bangalore. As my cousin and I are trying to figure out what to do, we connected her with the local church there. Because see, that's what the church is. That's what the church is. It's the presence of God for the most broken, the lonely, the hurting, the poor. And I thought to myself, when I was on a train that night, like, God, what the hell am I doing with my life? sit in the best of the best buildings money can buy. Like what, am I, like, what am I doing with my life? And I remember in that moment, the words that changed my life when I was 21 years old, and someone said, the local church is the hope for the world. And Jesus said, that's what you're doing. We sing this song. I, I really don't get emotional unless the Cubs win or... <laughs> One of my kids scuffs my shoes, that's about it. (laughs) There's a song that the worship team sings, I think it's called King of Kings, and there's a line that said, and the church of Christ was born and the spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, it shall not faint. And every time, every time I hear it in my car, I just start crying. Like This is what I've given my life to. Trust me, friends, I can make way more money doing other stuff. I could be way more famous doing other stuff. But I want to give my life to the one thing that Jesus is building. We are called to bring the presence of God in the world by proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God to the world, humbly and gently sharing the good news of Jesus to a world that is devastated by sin and brokenness, to bring the comprehensive rule of God's justice, mercy, compassion to a world that is otherwise influenced by the power of the devil which means, friends, we surrender our rights and privileges to be present in the world with others, to proclaim the good news of God while washing the feet of those who will betray us by sacrificing our time, our treasure, our talent, so that the message of Christ would elevate the soul, the mind, the body, and the heart of the physically, spiritually, and relationally poor. We are called to enter into the spaces of darkness and stop fleeing to the safe parts of the city, but rather be present in the places where the gates of hell have set up shop. We are called to be the people of justice and reconciliation. We are called to be present with those who mourn and with those who celebrate. The Christian life is a call to be as relatable as humanly possible. This is what Jesus has done for us. So a couple practical things and I'll end with this. Here's just a few ideas. If you have ideas of your own, you should do it. But here's just a few quick ideas. Number one, how to be present. If you're, act- if you, if you're able to be actually present, on Sundays. And by actually present, I don't mean just physically take a seat. I mean, look at other people, move to other people, pray with other people, invite other people, speak to other people, invite other people, love other people, confess with other people, repent with other people, celebrate with other people, mourn with other people, actually be present. Secondly, host a consistent dinner in your home. Thirdly, visit someone you know in this community or otherwise that is hurting and in need. Fourthly, ask a neighbor or a coworker a simple, sto- simple question, what is your story? And then sit patiently and listen for as long as they take. Number five, schedule consistently a night with nothing to do and ask those nights, ask on those nights, God, how can I be present? With you, with my family, with the church, with the world, how can I be present? Sixth, think of a mission trip this year for the next several years instead of a, yet another vacation. Think of a trip where you can actually be the hands and feet of Jesus. And then seventhly, Pick a place in the city and become a regular. When they know your name, they know your order, you're known there, and you know the people there. Church membership is to choose presence over preference and perfection. So over the next six weeks, choose wisely. And some of you, I get it, you're hurt, you have church hurt. Some of you don't trust me, and with good reason, you don't know me. And so what I'm gonna do, I just prayed this morning and thought, well, what could, what could I do to earn your trust? Because trust is earned. Don't trust me because I have a title. I made up that title. 
So I'm gonna, every Wednesday before prayer night from five to seven, I'm gonna sit in that lobby. Um, I'll bring some of our pastoral staff with us and we'll an I'll answer whatever questions you want. My family, questions about theology, doctrine, beliefs, leadership, where our money goes, what we believe about formation here, whatever you wanna talk about. You wanna just pray together? Let's pray together. You want me to pray for you? I'd invite you to pray for me. Whatever you wanna do. So for the next two months, every Wednesday, I'll be there five to seven and we can chat. Let me earn your trust. Let us earn your trust. And I pray that over time, God will heal you in this place and give you a vision for what it means to be a part of his people. Amen.